All right, welcome to Modern Macroeconomics. In this little lecture series, what we're gonna do is we're gonna emphasize kind of a new uh, set of ma macroeconomics that has really kind of evolved from the monetarists, right? So the kind of uh, ancestors of this modern macro is really the monetarist school of thought. And we're gonna look at NGDP targeting and then also the Taylor rule. So in the United States, the last links of the gold standard were broken in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And the debate during this time was really between kind of the, the campers, the Keynesian activist monetary policy advocates and the monetarists with the Keynesians seemingly winning in the short run, but then the monetarists holding the high ground after the 1970s. How this happened? Well, the 1970s were a period of very high inflation which led to the renewed interest in finding some sort of anchor for the price level. And it made inflation kind of enemy number one, right? And with the Phillips curve and expectations kind of ruining the original interpretation of the Phillips curve, the Keynesian model just didn't seem to hold up, but we did have really high inflation. So the monetarists kind of came out ahead. We saw the monetarists were just, hey, slow and steady increase in the money supply, not trying to combat different things and discretionary policy. We had runaway inflation and runaway unemployment. And so the campers, the Keynesian activist monetary policy advocates, it didn't seem to work out for them, but we did get really high inflation during this time period. So the monetarist policy was kind of in the forefront. Paul Volcker, becomes the Fed chairman and helps wrestle down inflation. In the period from 1979 to 1982, there was money supply targeting a la Friedman that was used to combat high inflation. But then a new approach had to fill the void of the kind of Keynesian consensus with the discretionary policy of the 60s and 70s. And simply flight, fighting inflation was no longer really the concern once once we kind of went through the trouble with Volcker of, of combating high inflation. And that was no easy time period, uh, but it seemed like, hey, we beat that. But did we didn't want to just leave macroeconomics as, well, let's not have inflation. So a large part of the monetarist approach was Friedman's concern of rules versus discretion. In the 1980s, this started to tip in favor of those who favored rules. However, strict rules were seen as too rigid or not just, you know, being something that we could actually implement politically. Yet we all felt the uh, unconstrained discretion of the original kind of view of the campers was just too flexible. So a middle ground to some extent was sought. Feedback rules rules that incorporated some feedback allegedly provided the best of both worlds the premier feedback rule is the taylor rule the taylor rule is essentially a promise to raise nominal interest rates if inflation is greater than our target inflation right so increase i that nominal interest rate if pi inflation is greater than our pi star, or the target inflation, right? So it's this promise to raise nominal interest rates if inflation is greater than our target inflation, and a second promise, right, to raise nominal interest rates if real GDP, y, is greater than our target growth rate, y star. The rule is named after John Taylor, the Stanford economist who first formulated it. This rule specifies not a money supply target, as Friedman had suggested, but a target for the short run interest rates that monetary authority sets in conducting their monetary policy like open market operations. Taylor's rule basically says that whenever inflation and or output are above their desired rates, the monetary authority should raise the target interest rate. If we are the Fed and we need to increase the interest rate, we do this by contracting the money supply. And we could do that by say, selling bonds via open market operations. Selling bonds sucks money out of the system. This action will raise the price of loanable funds, the interest rate, 
and thus it will slow down the economy by lowering investment right and large-scale consumption purchases and hence we get a lowering of the total amount of spending or aggregate demand right we could also say the opposite would be true uh, i.e if we wanted expansionary policy uh, when the inflation and or output are below the desired rates uh, we could lower the interest rates and, and do kind of the opposite of what we just explained here right and so the taylor rule is basically if we we uh, have a situation where the inflation and or output are above their desired rates then the monetary policy is to raise the target interest rate by contracting the money supply via monetary policy to slow down aggregate demand so so far this just sounds like counter cyclical monetary policy but keep in mind this is a monetary policy rule this is not at our discretion Remember, the monetarists did not disagree with the campers, the Keynesians, about how monetary policy influences the economy. They didn't say, buying bonds, that'll drop aggregate demand, and short-run aggregate supply will self-correct, or some other model like that. They acknowledged the Keynesian way of seeing how monetary policy influences the macro economy. They simply said, we cannot counter the business cycle with discretionary monetary policy though. The Taylor rule is not discretionary monetary policy. The rule is an equation. So here we see the equation, right? So at the top, we have the equation here and note that the first three terms of the equation, we already know this kind of relationship saying the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate but then with inflation right so go ahead and pause the video here and make sure you can you make sense of that within the equation so we have all of the variables listed out as to what they actually are and let's look at the start of this right the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate but then with inflation so we have the nominal interest rate is i is equal to R, the assumed real interest rate, plus some amount of inflation. Okay, fine, right? But then what we have is we have these alpha and beta uh, elements to this, right? So we kind of have part two is the alpha part and part three is the beta part. Alpha and beta are just multipliers that can be adjusted for estimated magnitudes of the importance of inflation or output. Right. And so the alpha estimator is kind of uh, saying how important is the inflation elements. Uh, right. So that middle category, the, the second component of the right hand of the equation and the beta is going to kind of modify how important output indicators are within our equation. So we really have these three kind of elements to what our nominal interest rate should be. The first one is that real interest rate plus inflation. And then we have the alpha element, which talks deals with inflation, and then the beta, which deals with the output idea. So the rule can be expressed as the following, right? We can look at the target nominal interest rate, our I, is equal to our equilibrium real interest rate. So that was that first part that we know, the real plus the inflation, right? Uh, the equilibrium real interest rate plus inflation plus the alpha element, which is our inf what we call our inflation gap, right? So the alpha segment of that equation is our inflation gap plus the beta element of our equation, which is our output gap. So we have our nominal, uh, our target nominal interest rate is equal to our equilibrium real interest rate plus inflation plus our inflation gap plus our real output gap. Okay, so we want to know kind of that terminology here. That first part of our equation is that, hey, real plus inflation is equal to our nominal, fine. But then those segments two and three, the inflation gap and the output gap, we want to know that terminology. The inflation gap is the difference between the rate of inflation and the desired rate of inflation, right? So the inflation gap is the difference between the rate of inflation and the desired rate of inflation. 
the real output gap, that beta element, the real output gap is the difference between the real GDP and potential GDP, right? So our real output gap, our output gap here is the difference between our real GDP and our potential GDP. With alpha and beta being weights needed for the inflation's role versus the output's role, how much are we going to say uh, each of these kind of is important? In Taylor's original estimate, the weight was actually just 0.5 for each of these. So we're not going to pay too much attention or talk about the, the relative weights, uh, but just so you understand why those multipliers are there, right? Okay, so what we can do is we can think of the Taylor rule and we can say, okay, let's say we have this Taylor rule, right? We have this idea where the target nominal interest rate is equal to the equilibrium real interest rate plus the inflation rate, but then plus an inflation gap and plus an output gap. So let's think about how this would actually be enacted. So imagine we're in the following situation and we're following the Taylor rule. What do we do, right? So you can go ahead and pause the video and think back to the equation that we have right, and try and see what would we actually do in this situation. So we're assuming an alpha and a beta of both 0.5 as the original ta Taylor rule estimated. And then we're saying, okay, there's a real interest rate that is out there of 3%. Inflation gets to 4%, the actual inflation gets to 4%, but our target rate of inflation is only 2%. And then we can say GDP uh, is equal to, uh, the target GDP is equal to 1%, right? And our target rate of inflation is at 2% and our GDP growth is actually at 1% as well, right? So what do we do in this situation? So we can fill this into our equation and we can see that inflation went up above the desired rate of inflation. So there is this inflationary gap. There is no output gap as our potential output was one right uh, and our target was one percent as well so we don't we don't have any gap there with the output gap right so we can plug all of our inflation and interest rate information in here and we can see what happens right nominal interest rate is equal to real plus inflation so we can also get this stuff in so this shows up as the start of the taylor rule three plus four is real uh, plus inflation, and that gives us a nominal of seven, right? So the Fed's uh, target nominal interest rate is going to be further impacted by either the inflation gap or if GDP is kind of going too strong or there's an output gap. In either case, what happens is the Fed is rule bound to increase the interest rate. In our case, we assumed GDP was right on target, so there is no output gap, right? So what we have so far is we have the real plus nominal at the start of our equation is that three plus four. So our nominal interest rate, or, or sorry, our real plus inflation is that three plus four. So we know that at least has to factor into our nominal interest rate. And then we also have in the middle, we have that inflation gap. And then at the end, we have our output gap. And we said the output gap is gonna be nothing. Right? But the inflation is higher than normal. So four is our current inflation, which is higher than two, our desired inflation. And so we do have an inflation gap. So what we have to do is we have to take that real interest rate plus our inflation, so three plus four, and then plus our multiplier times the inflation gap, right? And we will get an estimate for then our nominal interest rate because we then we don't have any output gap at the end of our equation is going to zero out, right? And so we can see this, we could go through and we could solve. And what we would see is we would have this, you know, nominal interest rate equal to seven plus 0.5 times four minus two. And what we get from this is an interest rate of eight. So we just solve through this equation and we can see the Fed's target nominal interest rate via the Taylor rule. So this equation spits out a target nominal interest rate of eight, according to the Taylor rule, given the situation that we were in, the measurements of our inflation and our real interest rate and our output levels, right? In contrast to our target levels of inflation and our target levels 
of output. So in this case, the nominal interest rate would have to be increased by one percentage point over the current market setting of just the nominal interest rate uh, being equal to the real interest rate plus inflation. So we have that seven plus one more uh, that we would have. So the Fed then is required by this rule, the Taylor rule, if we were following it, to sell bonds until it achieves an interest rate of eight, right? So inflation was getting out of hand. And so we needed to sell bonds to take money out of the economy. We were doing that targeting this interest rate of eight. So here we can do a second example. Assume that the real interest rate is three. Inflation is 2%. Our target inflation is also 2%. And this time, let's consider our economic economy's GDP. It's not hitting the previous trend line that it was. So let's assume potential GDP is 4%, right? And our real GDP is now at zero, right? And so we want to look at this and say, okay, well, what's going on with our growth rates here? We had 4% growth rate before as our goal, and it's actually achieving zero. But when it comes to the inflation rates and eh, we hit our target inflation of two percent uh, and so we're not going to have any kind of inflationary gap but we are going to see an output gap here all right so you can see what would the taylor rule do in this kind of situation when we're given that we have three percent real interest rate two percent inflation target two percent inflation uh, potential gdp of four percent and our real gdp actually at zero Right, and then the alpha and beta still set at the 0.5. Right, so what happens in this situation? The Fed's target nominal interest rate is going to be further impacted by the GDP or output gap here. Right, and so the Fed is going to be rule bound to try to kind of change interest rates to manipulate this situation. So, what we can see from the equation is that GDP is lower than it's desired, and so we can look at what happens to this equation. Our inflation gap is going to zero out in the middle uh, because we have in no gap. Our inflation is what we were targeting it at. And then we look at our output gap was that negative four multiplied by the, the 0.5 multiplier. And then what we do is we just take the first part of the, the first segment of the equation, that three plus two, or the real interest rate plus inflation, right? And then we add to it the output gap, which in this case is negative two. And so we're going to get a, an, an interest rate of 3%, right? So again, the Taylor rule equation here spits out a target nominal interest rate, in this case, three, right? So in this case, the nominal interest rate would have to decrease by two percentage points compared to the current market setting of just the nominal interest rate uh, being equal to the real interest rate three plus inflation two. So the Fed uh, with this Taylor rule in place would be required to sell bonds until it achieves an interest rate of three, right, in this case. So they would go through and we would be changing the interest rate. So that's the basics of the Taylor rule. But if we see the Taylor rule, we want, really want to think about it in context, right? So being able to use the formula, that's great and everything. Uh, but what we want to see is that what we learned coming out of the 1970s is that it could be really painful and politically difficult to bring down the rate of inflation or cool down kind of a, a booming or kind of pushed forward in, inflationary economy. Luckily, we had Paul Volcker and he really kind of uh, you know, took a lot of criticism during the time, but the Fed chairman fought against inflation and kind of staved that off. But that was politically really, really dangerous and it, it was tough to do. And it's not an easy thing. And so we come up with something that won't allow kind of that runaway inflationary stuff to happen. And we came up with things like the Taylor rule. Right. So once fighting off inflation is done, empirically, it seems possible with a reasonable rate of success when it's been actually a, a attempted to forestall the reoccurrence of high inflation or an overheating economy following things like a Taylor rule. So the monetary policy of the 1980s and 90s did not have a Taylor rule in place, but it might as well have. It 
in the United States, we basically followed this type of policy and it worked quite well, although we did not announce in advance, oh, we're going to commit to a Taylor rule uh, policy. But if you trace through what the Fed actually did, it's very similar to the Taylor rule, right? Uh, many analysts have argued that the rule provides a fa fairly accurate summary of U.S. monetary policy under Volcker and Alan Greenspan until Greenspan's last five years or so uh, once we hit the 2000s. Other countries like Canada and New Zealand have actually officially adopted inflation targeting rules and done fairly well. So the track record is pretty good and the concept seems to be a nice balance of doing something, but then also having a kind of rule-based approach or a limited rule-based system. So you could say, well, wait, you know, did we figure everything out? Is this what we should be doing? How could one possibly object to this? Well, there is a, the primary concern is that there's difficulties with the nature of the data that's being used with Taylor rules. It's well documented in the mainstream literature that macroeconomic data, it has some problems with it. And there's issues of kind of the historical nature of the data that we're using and that it needs to be updated and things like that. So economists disagree how to measure things like potential output. Right. And that is a very big element of the Taylor rule that we have to have right to get the economy right. Right. So which trends, models uh, and things, measurements do we actually use? Right. Depending on what we pick, we can have different Taylor rule solutions. And so we can have kind of issues with the data. Uh, and if you have bad data going in, any kind of algorithm or formula is going to spit out kind of a bad result. So there's still some debate over, you know, the nature of macroeconomic data, what data do we use, uh, what type of things are be, going to be recommended by Taylor rules, depending on what kind of Taylor rule we're actually following. Nonetheless, this move towards kind of this rule based approach that was kind of a signature of the early monetarists has really greatly impacted macroeconomics. And this Taylor rule looks a little bit more at kind of like inflation targeting and kind of uh, establishing a macroeconomic policy via rule for our macro economy. And there have been great benefits to uh, the nature of macroeconomic policy and in the United States, Fed actions uh, from insights uh, from things like the Taylor rule. All right, guys, in the next part of the lecture, we're going to look at NGDP targeting as kind of a outgrowth or contrast with the Taylor rule that we have here. But we're going to stick within this realm of modern macro and kind of this new age monetarist macroeconomics.